my like big bet in crypto right now is, is DeFi. Like I just, I'm so convicted that if nothing else, like get, take everything out of crypto. I just think that DeFi is a better product than TradFi. I just think it's a better product and products will always, good products will always win out. This episode is brought to you by Core, the brand new non-custodial wallet that offers a seamless and secure experience on Avalanche. You'll hear more about Core later in the show. All right, what's going on, everyone? We are back with another roundup. We got Santi joining us. Uh, Santi, looking looking sharp today, my friend. Looking sharp. Thank you. Just trying to be more like you, sir. <laughs> Got to rise really, to the occasion. I think it's really that the YouTube comments were uh, piling up on you these last couple of weeks, and uh, I, I think you're trying to put on a face for the YouTube folks. Shout out to everyone that's commenting on YouTube. I, I do read them, and <laughs> it, they're always appreciated. And uh, so, yeah, keep keep them coming. Yeah, nice. You see my new background? I changed my desk around. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I like the color and this. Yeah, it's yeah, pretty painted awesome. Painted the walls. We got it all set up now. Is it, is this you like transitioning now into married life? Oh, I guess did I disclose that or? Uh. <laughs> I mean, it's fine. We can talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I've got <laughs> getting married in three weeks. So who cares uh, about the merge? Like <laughs> that's the real merge. Yana that's was the, getting. Yana was getting married. <laughs> I am merging one week after the merge. Yeah, there exactly. The real oh merge. God. I really real hope merge. My, no one's talking about. It's a it's a good thing my fiance would never listen to this podcast, or uh, she would just be wildly embarrassed that I said that. So yeah, no. I mean, this <laughs> this this background though is uh, actually you know what's cool is Digital Asset Summit, our conference. Uh, shout out Das. If you want to come, you can get a plug, uh, a discount, Yano 250. I'm competing with Mike on uh, on that discount code right now. But uh, the merge is happening the day of Das, so that'll be interesting. Which. Wow. Our, our events actually coincide nicely. Like we had a permission list was right after Doe and Terra stuff unfolded. So high drama around BlockWorks events. Yeah, seriously. I think most <laughs> conferences are in and around most conferences is when crazy, funky stuff goes down and happens. Not all po- negative, not all positive. It's just, it's usually when uh, a lot of news comes out. Yeah, it's true. It's true. All right. You tweeted out, I am recording the roundup in 30 minutes. What should we cover? Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of good stuff. So where do you want to start? Um, let's see. I mean, there's, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you have an opinion. I'm of the um, mind that I'm going to let you do a more of talking and b guide more of the discussion. So we. Can I mean, let's get the it. let's get the fun one out of the way, which I just think mm-hmm. is the most absurd one. Uh, Michael Saylor was accused of tax fraud on Wednesday. Um, yeah. It was announced that the district attorney general, uh, that DC's AG, claimed that Saylor had basically been personally illegally avoided uh, more than twenty-five million dollars of DC taxes by preve- uh, he, he was pretending to be a resident of other jurisdictions that had lower personal income taxes. So basically, he had said that he was in um, Florida, Florida maybe, most of the time. I think yeah. it was Florida. He said he was in Florida most of the time, and then they were able to track like exactly like like private plane logs. Of where he had actually been. And I mean, I think a lot of this, you posted a great video of him, you know, really just saying like Bitcoin is a vehicle to do tax evasion and then just like a big F you to tax men. It's like, you know, like, uh, I don't know, you poke a bear and they're going to come after you. Like it it was just uh, his comments kind of like if you compare his rhetoric at the very beginning when he came out saying, look, I believe in Bitcoin to now. It's just like he's sort of become a madman of just being very, I don't know, I feel like uh, it, like increasingly becoming very aggressive. And I think this type of tone never kind of bodes well because it's very polarizing. Whereas, I don't know, I think we try to be pretty objective here. And yeah, everyone should go see the tweet and we can link it of what he was saying publicly on air. And it, the, the the if you read the report, the Fed's, like the IRS and I think it was the the DC general prosecutor um, or attorney general, like they quoted like that excerpt from the video that you posted, uh, which was that he sort of said that Bitcoin could be a vehicle for tax evasion. You're like, well, n- not really. Just, the guy's <laughs> just a fucking idiot. I'm like, you, what are you doing? You're a CEO of a public company and you're saying you, if you push me too far, then I'll tell you that I've lost my Bitcoin in a boating accident. I'm like, buddy, you are the CEO. You're the, one of the most prominent faces of Bitcoin right now. And oh, man, you're just such an idiot. Also, good luck paying, good luck paying those taxes. Like the, he, the, when the yeah. market's down, it gets tough to pay those taxes. Yeah. I think he, what are they I saying? He owes, he owes more a than tune million. of 25 million or something. 
Yeah. Um, here's the thing, like, there's sort of this idea that like crypto is like headless marketing. It doesn't have a head of marketing. It doesn't have like a one figure head. Like some protocols like have like, you know, Vitalik, you could see as, you know, a very prominent figure within the ETH community, Ethereum community. But, he, you know, everyone has different narratives and memes and like, you know, things about ETH, ETH as money, ultrasound money, and then there's other components. And so Bitcoin's as well. And so it almost, almost makes you wonder, like, what is better? Like in many ways, like having like some madman's just like LARPing about like, I don't know, like what they think, like, you know what I mean? If, if, if Sailor perhaps was like recognized as the figurehead, the champion of Bitcoin amongst many in like traditional markets. And like, they look at that and you, as you said, you know, you're really scared. I'm like, not er the, the problem is not everyone in the Bitcoin camp is like Sailor, right? Not everyone in the, in the Ethereum camp is like, you know, X or Y pick, pick your influencer of choice. And so, yeah, it's pretty difficult to, um, you know, to navigate like that, because this is why I think most people on the outside are kind of afraid. I'm like, wow, this, this space is, I mean, it's a good reminder that like the most ridiculous people on social media usually rise to the top and become almost like the heroes of the industry. So let's like, let's look at the past heroes who have fallen this year, three arrows, three arrows, right? Kyle and Sue, those are heroes of the industry. Uh, Doe was a hero of the industry. Michael Saylor, hero of the industry. It reminds me of, mm -hmm. of that of that saying, right? Never meet your heroes. It's like, I don't know. I'm kind of waiting for like, well, who's the next hero to fall? Who who do you think is the next hero to fall? Who's the next one? No, I never want to make a prediction about someone falling, but I will say, like, as a general matter, anytime you glorify someone, it's usually like a bad sign, right? Like, we tend to. Like success is not driven unless by one particular Harry person. Potter, then we can, like, we can glorify them. <laughs> we should always kind of <laughs> correct. But, uh, but yeah, you know what I mean? Like, I think we oh, tend to attribute yeah. success and failure to one specific person, especially success. And it's really the case. It's sort of a combination of factors. And so I think it's always important to understand why people were successful, but like never glorify them because there's always a component of like, like, what about yeah. the team behind Facebook, for instance? It was not all Zuckerberg. Like there's so many things that went into the success of Facebook as an example. And so I think just to glorify or vilify one particular individual, I think is just to sort of misses the point. So anyway. I think it's a good reminder that, uh, I mean, here, I'll read you this headline. New York Times, MicroStrategy Chairman Michael Saylor accused of fraud by the SEC. The date on that is December 2000. So 20 years later, I mean, here's the story. Michael Saylor settled the civil charges that were filed in federal court. Uh, SEC contended that Saylor and two other MicroStrategy execs um, had committed fraud in reporting profits when the company was actually losing money. So I don't know. It's like if you are going to choose a hero, just make sure your hero hasn't been uh, yeah. publicly committing fraud. It is, so. The last thing I'll say is it is crazy like how like short term, it's like goldfish uh, memory that investors have, not just in crypto, but in general, like, you know, very short term and people overlook and don't do diligence on like, you know, you know, unfortunately, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk maker. You want to talk maker? Yeah. Let's definitely talk about that. First of all, I know you've been digging. This is where I get to ask you most of the questions because you become very deep in the maker ecosystem to the point that you become a, a, a voted in delegate, right? I just became a recognized delegate. A recognized delegate. About. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe tell us what that means and what you've been looking at that excites you about all the different DeFi protocols you could be spending time on. Yeah, I mean, I so here's what happened over the last like several months. I've just gotten very, I've gone very deep into Maker. I've done read everything I can possibly read, talked to everyone I can talk to, learned a lot. We had that episode with um, Monet Supply um, and Hexanaut, uh, who's an engineer over at Maker. I've just like tried to go really, really deep. Reason being, I have like you're you're very deep into gaming. My like big bet in crypto right now is is DeFi. Like I just I'm so convicted that if nothing else, like get take everything out of crypto, I just think that DeFi is a better product than TradFi. I just think it's a better product and products will always, good products will always win out. I have a very strong conviction that DeFi will grow exponentially in the coming decades, right? By orders of magnitude. And I think that if Maker plays their cards right, they have the opportunity to become the backbone of DeFi. And if that happens, right? Two, two big things, two big ifs, right? If DeFi gets, grows exponentially, eventually gets bigger than CFI and then gets bigger than TradFi. I think that will happen. I also think Maker will become the most 
uh, will become the backbone of DeFi. And if if those two things happen, I think Maker will go down in history, like could become one of the most impactful initiatives in the history of global finance. And that's just an insane opportunity. Um, I think that to achieve that, though, Maker needs to evolve, right? It needs like a better growth strategy. It needs improved governance. It needs more scalable operations. And I think I can take what I've learned at BlockWorks over the last like four and a half years, building it and launching it and scaling it uh, and apply some of those things to Maker. So like, yeah, I don't know. I was encouraged to do this by a lot of folks, like big shout out to Hasu and uh, Mark over at Maker, Monet Supply. Like they, yeah, they were very helpful in encouraging me to do this. And yeah, I just went for it and got voted in. Uh, there's a big mm-hmm. thing happening at Maker today, which yeah, is... Please tell us. Yeah, there's a big thing happening at M- Maker today, which is just um, a big conversation around what is the end like the end state of Maker and what should happen. So someone like Hasu um, uh, is looking to basically create like almost what looks more like a board of directors, I would say. of Ma- there's, there's a lot more in it. And, and actually, Hasu is going to come on the podcast and talk about this, but um, so I won't mm-hmm. get too into it. And then there's... Um, Rune wants to basically uh, create what he calls the end game plan. And it's, uh, I would say, I would say a very comprehensive plan to try to eventually, um, the, the new update is potentially free float die. Um, and that, and that would be the big like end goal. Uh, and with the, with the like North star of saying we are a uh, self-supporting, uh, self-sustaining, censorship-resistant protocol. Big, really, really, really tough goal, right? And so he just came out with this week, um, like more details on what that looks like. And I, I actually, so I've been kind, uh, kind of skeptical of Rune's end game plan, to be honest, um, but I thought his strategy makes a lot of sense. And so what it is, is like for the next three years, um, he's basically saying for the next three years, have unlimited real world asset exposure. And the pushback on real world assets has been, uh, okay, well, since we saw tornado cash, like, doesn't it mean if real world assets become the collateral of Dai, doesn't that mean that we're like more uh, open to kind of authoritarian threats and like they could basically seize some of the collateral of Dai, uh, which makes us like more at the whim of the regulators? Um, so basically, Rune's thing is for the next three years, just go all in on real world assets, unlimited real world asset ex- exposure with the goal of like accumulating max ETH. Uh, and then after three years, you would cap the real world assets at 25%. Uh, the next is like you would keep the peg for three years. So the USD to die peg, you keep that for three years. And you could even go longer if there's no authoritarian authoritarian threat. Uh, and then the next is you would delay the free float if collateral becomes 75% decentralized. So if 75% of the collateral is crypto native, like Bitcoin and ETH, um, you would delay the free float. And the the reason you don't go all crypto collateral right now is because there's just not enough crypto basically to uh, to increase the total addressable market of uh, and to scale DAI. Uh, you you kind of need to be able to scale DAI proportionally with the with the demand, and for that you probably need real world assets. So and that's for folks listening because the reason why that's true is because DAI is collateralized, and so. You, know, you think about the upper bound of DAI supply is tied directly to its only crypto collateral while the size of the crypto market. Whereas if you onboard non-crypto assets as collateral types, then it really increases the the upper bound. What um what is the kind of why is this relevant now in terms of this free float? And maybe for context, like it's not free flowing today free floating today. And so maybe explain a little bit of those mechanics and why is it kind of being discussed uh, now? I think that, so in, in, in maybe what Rune would say, and, and honestly, we should just invite Rune on, but I think he believes that Maker only has two options, which I would agree with him on, actually. I think there's probably only two options, compliant, um, completely compliant path, and you end up operating uh, almost like a neobank, right? Like a Monzo or N26 or one of, like a fintech platform and you're completely regulated and you're a good product, right? It'd be a really good product. It'd be hyper efficient, but like you do have to fit into the regulatory boundaries. Um, the other path that you can go down is like complete decentralization. And the way that you do that is um, you really minimize the degrees that regulatory crackdowns can damage a protocol. And one of those things would be uh, free floating die, essentially. So... And when you see the price of DAI gra- like fluctuate, it's never fixed. It's, it does fluctuate 
today, right? I mean, you've seen the the peg, if you will, gravitate and uh, can oscillate around the range of a dollar. But at times it has I mean, lost. You were, that you were peg, deep in it, right? March 12, um, 2020. Most noticeably, like March. What do you. As someone who was very hands-on with Maker a couple of years ago, um, like what do you what are your your thoughts on Maker right now? I I've continued to believe the Maker is sort of the backbone of DeFi. It is perhaps the most important protocol. And for context, historically, Maker really opened up the possibility of having decentralized finance on Ethereum, because in the absence of Maker, you know the smart contract that like allows anyone to mint this stable unit called DAI with some collateral in this initially, and for a long time, it was only Ethereum. E- ETH as collateral, which is sort of pristine and you, you could say um, censorship resistant. Um, so, so when you think about like in the prior cycle, you had the value of that collateral drop, kind of what you're seeing now, 70, 80%. And DAI really maintained its peg. And so... I think that really opened up people's imaginations and certainly did mine to say, wow, okay, you have won this like <clears throat> this like very well functioning system that, you know, while you have a very volatile collateral type, it has maintained its peg. And if it can survive in this very adversarial market condition, which was 2018 and post crash, like you you saw a path towards saying, okay, well, okay, there's something here. And a lot of people historically use Maker to not have to sell ETH and borrow against their stack to pay for, you know, other yeah. stuff, you know, pay for real world stuff. You know, DAI would be converted to and sold in an exchange for and to go buy a house or whatever, or pay for food or what have you. And so that was like, that to me feels and has been a killer use case, like money markets and the ability to have a stable unit of account across DeFi was, it's a prerequisite for having decentralized finance. And so to me that, and I still think that Maker is a leader in the space. It has a very robust, it's a very, it's not a very intuitive, straightforward protocol to understand, but it has done a lot of things over the years. It's been resilient. And um, I think it now would characterize it as moving slower than other protocols. Yeah, yeah. Rightfully so, because hmm. like the central, it's almost like when you hear Jay Powell and central banks never, are never very explicit, are never very rash in their, you would think, in their decision making. They're, they're very like measured and guarded. And I think in many ways, that's the role the maker plays in this ecosystem. Um, well, if that, and that's why in my mind, like if I, I, have, I have some friends who have recently come into crypto in the last, in the last cycle. And they're like, well, why is everyone talking about maker now? I didn't hear anyone talking about maker in a bowl and maker is one of those uniquely, like almost inversely correlated with, uh, with the market type of projects where like in bear markets, I think maker thrives because they don't get ahead of their skis in the bowl. They build slowly. They have real checks and balances on governance. Um, and so that causes maybe them to build a little slower than other folks, uh, but what mm-hmm. happens is like they're going to be around longer than 99.9% of projects. Um, and that's why in the bear market, like I think Maker ends up doing really, really well. There's a lot of focus on them. Probably. Uh, in the bull, like will their price of their token go up more than the hottest projects? Like probably not, but I think that's totally fine. You mentioned it's a mm-hmm. complicated protocol to understand. I, my yeah. God, it is. I think it's a barrier to entry to folks to come in to Maker's governance. I've, I've spent so much time uh, trying to understand Maker, you've got the PSM, you've got how DAI works, you've got real world assets, you've got the D3M uh, providing liquidity to other protocols, you've got like the DSR, the DAI savings rate, you've got now meta dies, you've got protocol owned vaults, you've got uh, how liquidations work, you've got like the surplus reserve. Mm-hmm. Well, it is very complicated, I must say. <laughs> no, it definitely is. Um, I will say it's, uh, although I said earlier that it is a protocol that has moved slower than others. <clears throat> it's also charting new territory in onboarding real world assets as collateral. And I remember talking to the team, you know, almost two years ago about this, particularly like uh, accounts receivable and like working with a project called Centrifuge. And now, you know, obviously they've come a long yep. way in that, which is a controversial move, honestly. Uh, it, it is hard. Um, and it does pose the question of, well, 
what happens if that collateral is frozen. And it's really like where atoms meet bits. And I think that, look, if they're successful, I think it will be interesting precedent on a number of fronts. One, what happens in a situation of bankruptcy and like if part of that collateral like is not honored and where do you settle at? And, you know, that in and of itself. And the other one is, you know, this whole, again, given the tornado situation of censorship, resistance or lack thereof, and what that really means for a quote unquote decentralized protocol, but that is, you know, perhaps moving in a direction where some feel that, you know, in a, in a version where I think governance will, will vote in and, and monitor what percentage and introduce a cap of what percentage of the total kind of collateral base uh, backing die is kind of these real world assets, which it would never get to a point where it's like a hundred percent or, you know, even close to that. But nonetheless, I mean, it, That's it, the- is, uh, it is pretty interesting. Um, a lot of things going on in Maker recently are, are pretty groundbreaking, I would say. All right, folks, this episode is brought to you by our friends at Avalanche and Ava Labs. They have just dropped a new crypto wallet called Core. You're going to be hearing a lot about it over the coming months. You can now be one of the first to try it out. Here's the reason I'm excited to partner with them on Empire. Right now, crypto wallets and browser extensions, they feel clunky. They feel non-intuitive. That's why Ava Labs built Core. It's a free, non-custodial browser extension that gives Avalanche users a seamless and secure Web3 experience across the entire Avalanche ecosystem. Here are a few reasons to try Core. Here's what I'm experimenting with. Number one, Core has intuitive dashboards with a unified display for all of your NFT collections, all your crypto assets. You can execute asset swaps directly inside the wallet. It's a really nice experience. Uh, maybe you want to earn yield or borrow against your Bitcoin, uh, but you don't want to do it on one of those C5 platforms right now. Core's native bridging functionality makes it really easy to bridge your Bitcoin to Avalanche's robust DeFi ecosystem. Last but not least, Core makes on-ramping super easy. You can convert dollars to crypto right now using the MoonPay integration. Just takes a few clicks. Download Core today using the link in the show notes. It's really, really nice. Uh, If you are interested in the Avalanche ecosystem at all, you have to be using Core. Download Core using the link below. Now, let's get back to the show. That the real world asset conversation is one of the most, I think, important conversations and like biggest decisions that any protocol has ever had to make in my mind. Yeah. It's sort of, I think there's just like two camps in crypto. One, which is, it goes back to like the purists of Maker, which have always said, mm-hmm. and we're very critical of onboarding <clears throat> USDC as collateral because, you know, obviously USDC is, is, can be frozen as it has been recently and over time. And so it's like, wait a minute. The purists have always said, well, let's just keep it to collateral that is, you know, censorship resistant like Ethereum. Um, and, you know, there's another camp that is perhaps more practical that says, how can we actually make DAI really this kind of the de facto, the more popular right. kind of stable coin out there? And, and th- which is what you're saying, which is you're not necessarily as focused on censorship resistance but more so the practicality of the protocol. And I think that type of camp is always, and I sort of fall more in that camp, actually more strictly in that camp, which says, I think DeFi needs to be and will be compliant and it will be permissioned in some capacity. Like not to say that, like if you want to play in this really fun, really transparent, really frictionless decentralized system, you're going to have to, you know, KYC, AML, and do certain things that are important for law enforcement and regulators. But that doesn't mean like, but in order, but doing that, first of all, you're already doing that when you go through an exchange. So (laughs) nothing's really different. Um, Of course, the criticism to all that, and my last point here is, you know, open question time and time again, there are some, I would say politicians, not necessarily policymakers that have been more critical of DeFi and crypto generally. And there's always that like question mark of, you know, if crypto becomes really big, will people want to squash it altogether? And it, while it remains a possibility, I continue to think that the more, the longer that this system exists and crypto as a whole exists, the more that I think it's going to survive and exist and be and kind of coexist in a world where, yeah, you could argue that Bitcoin and some crypto assets like are undermining kind of like 
the the power of nation states as an alternative non-sovereign kind of store of value, if you will. But I sort of think that the longer this exists, like governments will just sort yeah. of assume that it's like just have no choice but to like understand it, adopt it and work with it and it can coexist. I think that maybe thought to, for listeners to think about this weekend and just to explore is like, is that question, right? Which I, because I do think they're mutually exclusive. I do think they're at odds with each other, those two camps. Um, and I think it's important to know, almost really just think about like, what camp do you fall in, right? Like, should you, and, and maybe using Maker as an example, like, do you basically just try to get Maker to be as big as humanly possible and become uh, like, in the game with like in, in the CFI game, right on the same level, like on board, uh, create vaults for like these big real world asset vaults, like work. If, uh, you know, a big fund, a billion dollar fund wants to create a, uh, RWA vault, like, do you do it? And do you, uh, knowing that that maybe ends up making you more like a compliant, eventually potentially KYC AML like platform, uh, do you want to go in that route or do you want to go in the complete decentralization, uh, completely decentralized governance at the trade-off of decreasing your total addressable market? Yeah, it is a very philosophical question. And some maybe old timers would say yeah. like, then what does this all matter? Like, what are we working towards? Like, what's the end goal for crypto? And I mean, I I would be happy with a compromise where like – you be, make finance more efficient and you remove friction and there's always trade-offs. You're never at a perfect decentralization. You're never at a perfect, like, are we going to be in a world where like you disintegrate nation states and you create network states? Well, you know, biology, I think makes a good point around that, like fine. But I also think that <clears throat> my version of the world is where one where you continue to have like certain governments to provide and fund certain public goods and, and enforce certain things. And look, you know, credit has always been enforced with a perceived, you know, threat of violence and law enforcement and, you know, but I think that my version of this is like kind of like Montesquieu, which is, you know, there are three, currently three like legs of the stool that create checks and balances within a political organization, which is a legislative, executive and judicial. And I think crypto in many ways is that third one, which is, I think what ascribed to what Baji is saying and others are, which is ultimately... It is this idea that people can exit a system more easily and have an alternative, which is called Bitcoin or Ethereum or something else, that creates more accountability because it's transparent. It creates more, I think, pressure on politicians and the political system to kind of honor and serve their constituents in the best manner possible because governments end up becoming more like corporations. It becomes a more competitive geopolitical sphere where people can migrate more easily because it can move money faster. They can move money cross border. They don't have to have and hold a local shit coin like the Turkish Lira. They can actually hold something called Ethereum or Bitcoin, which for all intents and purposes might be more stable than 90% of all other currencies. And I think that's the, like, I'm, I would be happy with that. And like that scenario where governments kind of feel a little bit more pressure to honor their constituents and, and, and serve them to the best possible way, as opposed to trying to like, you know, be very rigid and like exert violence and threats to control a population. And I think ultimately that would be a better yeah. world, not perfect. Nothing ever is, yeah. but I think it would be a better world in that scenario. And I think crypto enables that. Moving on. Let's talk about another lending and borrow platform in DeFi, uh, Compound. Um, yes. I don't know if you followed this, but uh, so Compound this past week yeah. executed a governance proposal <laughs> that updated its chain link price feeds that contained uh, a code error. The code error has frozen the CETH, so the Compound ETH borrowing and lending markets. This is how I, I haven't dug into it too deep, but this is how I understand it. Um, the, so the code error froze the CETH bar and lend markets. Users can still repay debt and add collateral to avoid liquidation. No funds are at risk, I'm pretty sure. So there's a new governance proposal that's uh, been put forward to revert to the formerly uh, used price feeds, right? Obviously, this is the this is the obvious thing to do. You, you, you introduce a bug and then you kind of revert the bug. But Compound has uh, what's what they refer to as a seven-day time lock, meaning it takes seven days for a new update to be implemented. Um this is 
kind of the second time that uh, that the time lock has that compound has been hurt because their governance has a seven day time lock. I'm just, I'm curious. I don't really care about the compound thing as much. I'm just curious to get your take on time locks. And I don't know if you have, you have any thoughts there on like if they're preferable or the, there's too high of a downside. What do mm-hmm. you think there? Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the interesting thing here is uh, when compound makes upgrades, anyone can submit a proposal and the code to upgrade a particular component mechanism of the protocol. In this case, the Oracle um, price feed, and, you know, while, you know, it's pretty interesting to anyone, anyone can submit it, that proposal and it could be passed through governance, like um, there can be mistakes and bugs found. And so it is a little bit more, I think, rigid in that sense, where like once a proposal passes, like it, the code goes into effect. And so, um, you know, yeah, it sure has a time lock. So you have seven days, but still like to revert that is not as easy as perhaps like other protocols where the team can like pause stuff and like quickly patch it. And so like for context, like in October of last year, compound had a, uh, you know, another bug that made like over a hundred million dollars of comp claim claimable mm-hmm. by protocol users. And yeah. it was sort of like a big, like once that happened, like, of course, some, a lot of people claimed and some sold and the team was like trying to like, at some point even threaten like certain users was like, Hey, give back the comp. And, you know, it's like, who's right and wrong in that situation? Like, uh, so anyways, um, I think this goes back to, I think one discussion that we're having on the regulatory side, which is, you know, the immutability of the code and who can actually upgrade a particular contract. Um, and I think where I settle with all this is I think in this stage where there's still a lot of issue, like there's still a lot of bugs in, in DeFi. I think you can still assume that over the next five years, where this is chaotic innovation, there's still going to be a lot of bugs uh, as people try to push boundaries of innovation. And so I think it's really important. One, yes, code should be immutable on like touching user funds. Like a team should never have the ability to upgrade a contract, to, like all of a sudden be able to like migrate and drain a particular like in touch user funds. But I think on the periphery, I think you could argue that the team should have like at mm-hmm. least like certain like you know, big red, big red eject buttons. If things go wrong, like you can pause it. And I think this is what happened here. So yeah, this is just a reminder that, um, you know, this was to be fair, this particular governance proposal and code that was implemented was audited, I think three times by three different providers. And somehow like it's still malfunction. It still had a bug. And so, this is just a state um, we're in. I mean, I'm happy that they were able to pause it and, and it sounds like no user funds were like lost, but still it's uh, it's unfortunate. Just a reminder that even for a big protocol that's been around yeah. for a long time, like Compound. Yeah. I mean, I think all these things are good when things are going well, right? Like a time lock is inherently useful except in, uh, except in emergencies, right? In which it's a bug, not a feature. So maybe it would be interesting to. The question is, how do you define like a time lock if it's good or bad, right? May, like it, you can have a time lock for like new yeah. proposals, but they be deemed good upgrades. And then no time lock for like when you need to like pause and make sure that like, you know, people are not hurt. It's weird because code doesn't make that distinction. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's. I mean, let's play this out, right? It's like, uh, so if, if you have a token, if, if your voting power can be bought in the open market, um, upgrading like security functions using voting power with that token is inherently an attack vector. If you can use that token to, if you can buy that token in the open market. So maybe the takeaway yeah. is that you design emergency actions that can react to things, but can't proactively rug, but that still feels like you're reacting. Um, yeah. yeah, maybe it's maybe the solutions like multi sigs with yeah. trusted signers with like limited pause and emergency action. I, I really don't know. Actually, I really don't know. Um, hmm. I would love to. We should we should have some security experts on here uh, to talk about like maybe folks from Open Zeppelin. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the governance attack vectors are going to continue to be a thing especially as the value in these protocols continues to go up and say like, yeah, of course, like maybe you can't upgrade the ability to touch user funds, but maybe you introduce code that has like a malicious kind of price feed that is able to manipulate it. And then you're able to drain and get away with like, you know, a lot of, a lot of the hacks and def- a lot of the, 
a lot of the bugs in DeFi have been and like hacks or user funds have been lost. Like Cream, for instance, like this happened multiple times is when there's a faulty Oracle price feed and all of a sudden like you're able right. to manipulate that through flash loans and, you know, get away with like, you know, um, getting more of the collateral versus what you, you know. So anyways, what I'm trying to say is it is, uh, it is, DeFi has always been a very adversarial environment. And so you just got to assume that like, and build m- multiple sale yeah. safe uh, mechanisms in place to be able to react very quickly if there's an attack that's going on. Let's, uh, this is a maybe call to the audience. If you know any good security firms, I mean, the ones I would probably invite on are like Trail of Bits, I think does a good job. Chain Security, Open Zeppelin. Uh, but if there are other folks who, are, who think that they're building it, like the cutting edge of even independent guys like Sam, Sam, Son, and a few others out there that are really good. Yeah, cool. Um, what's next? What are we talking about? Arbitrum? Um, sure. I actually yeah. don't even know too much about. So uh, here's uh, Arbitrum is launching Nitro. I think they launched it today or yesterday. Yesterday? Today. Today. Basically, Nitro is an upgrade to Arbitrum that allows for exponentially higher throughput and efficiency. It went live today or yesterday uh you say today uh so i'll trust you on this um today today yeah I think yeah today, i mean yeah. my understanding of i don't know too much about this except that it makes yeah. things cheaper and it makes uh increases the throughput that's like and it seems i i, I met uh steven the founder of Offchain labs which runs arbitrum i met him actually mm-hmm. at a urinal at permissionless and asked him some questions and he was yeah, while on the urinal uh, I was like, are you? I was like, hey, uh, can you talk to me about optimistic rollups? And uh, I was like, are you Steven from Arbitrum? He's like, yeah, what's up? He, I was like, I'd like some two questions about Arbitrum. Yeah. It's like the smartest sounding answers I've ever heard. And uh, I was like, okay, you seem like a big brain. I trust you here. <laughs> so, I, I mean, hopefully, hopefully you know more yeah. about this one than, than I do. But I do, I do know that yeah, it's a big bit. upgrade. Yeah, it is. I mean, Arbitrum has been live for like a, a little under a year. And uh, I think... Uh, uh, along with op, um, optimism is, pro, you know, the two most widely, well, I guess if you consider um, Polygon, but, you know, from an OR optimistic rollup, L2's Arbitrum and Optimism are the game, like two names in town. And yeah, this is a pretty big deal for them. I think they've, <clears throat> I've always really liked how they've kind of methodically rolled out um, their, um, the protocol. And I think Nitro is a big upgrade. Um Yeah. This is a good, good, good chart by uh, Blockworks Research. Sam Martin. Um, you can. This is Arbitrum versus Optimism daily transactions, and you can see Optimism has been in dark purple. Has been slightly higher. Um, what is five thirty one for Optimism? This is probably like the OP token launching or something like that. Um, and but now you can see for the first time that Arbitrum. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Or maybe for the second or third time, but Arbitrum daily transactions are now higher. Um, Anything else on Arbit- on uh, Nitro? L two L two season's coming. I feel like L two season like came and went in the narrative, but I mean, if you just look at the data, uh, L twos are just month over month continuing to grow. So I think it's just like slow and steady wins the race. Long term value accrual of these tokens is going to be really interesting to watch. Um, yeah, some of the more interesting questions are like again, time time again, people are like, well, doesn't this detract from the value prop of ETH? Like like a lot of fees going on L2, but it's like, you know, like there's still sediment happening on the L1. So you're still using the L1. So I think I've always been of the opinion that like L2s are net positive and win-win for the L1 as well. In this case, Ethereum is a base sediment layer because everything that happens in the L2 at some point needs to be reconciled and settled in the L1. And so you're just freeing up a lot of capacity at the L1, um, which is in this case, Ethereum. Uh, And so, while today, like you, people may not see it, but L2s really are going to enable, you know, kind of mainstream use cases um, that if you think about all the different kind of verticals that are seem to be emerging in in crypto today, and it's like NFTs are big, gaming will yeah. be big, you know, starting to see early indications of that. And, you know, DeFi has continued to be a thing and a lot of DeFi protocols have deployed in these L2s. And so, <clears throat> you know, not to mention a lot of the different use cases that weren't kind of practically feasible in an L1 and become much more economical and, and their value prop really shines in an L2, particularly like very intensive, both at the smart contract, but also in terms of frequency, like op, these are options and perpet, like, you know, perps, um, 
you know, stuff like that hasn't really been feasible in an L1 like Ethereum. But there, there will be, if you look at what synthetics and the efficiency gains that they've had in an L2, like optimism, it's, it's pretty cool um, what's happening. And I think people may or may not be paying too much attention to that. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Here, here's the magic number in my mind is 2.9%, right? That's the, that's the fee that credit cards usually take is 2.9%. So if we can get gas fees plus borrow fees plus app fees or uh, L1 settlement fees plus L1 data fees plus L2 fees lower than that, those com- those three numbers combined lower than L than uh, than 2.9%, which is credit card fees. I mean, that becomes really interesting, right? That goes back to this, the, the payment narrative of 2016 and 2015 that just kind of was probably five years too early, seven years too early. So, and I think, and then we have EIP 4844 coming, which will further improve this, right? Which will take, you know, the, the merge mm-hmm. does not lower transaction fees. L2s and EIP 4844 take care of that. So it's really exciting. Exactly. By the way, if, if folks haven't used Arbitrum, I would, I would recommend uh, bridging some assets over to Arbitrum and actually playing around with Arbitrum because it's, it's real. It's once you play around with DeFi with these really, really low fees, it's, you can see, you can see how it, it almost becomes addicting actually. It's like, wow, you can just cruise money. It's like, you can just cruise money around in a way that you've never been able to do it before. It's really, really cool. So, um, all right. Another <laughs> borrow yeah. and lend protocol in DeFi. We've got Ave talking about Ave for the second week in a row. Um, Ave has a new proposal to uh, pause ETH borrowing for the period leading up to the ETH merge. It just went live on Ave's governance uh, portal. Um, the upcoming uh, merge creates new risks for the protocol, uh, is, is what the proposal says. And the proposal aims to ensure that Ave remains solvent by temporarily pausing ETH borrowing. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know if you have thoughts on this one. If you're, I know you're close to the Ave team. I don't know if you have uh, thoughts on on this proposal here, but curious to get your take. Yeah, it's interesting. I think it it raises uh, attention to a particular vector here where like if you if two versions of ETH exist like ETH, ETH like Ethereum and Ethereum Classic for instance and you have both and like there is a possibility where like you know some tokens excluding ETH like whatever the other token is called like the proof of work chain ETH if that's used as collateral then that probably loses value relative to the you know, ETH that we know, like the proof of stake ETH. Um, and so some of those loans may be underwater and, and have to be liquidated. And so it's more of like, even if that happens, like there should be orderly liquidations, but given the magnitude of ETH and potentially, you know, it could place some stress in the system. And I think uh, the proposal is trying to address that um, to some extent. Um, and yeah. so you never want the situation where you can't like liquidate these loans if, uh, and and Ave solvency could could be put into question, or like they're in the hole for that. It's like bad debt. So I think the I don't, I don't it's it's hard to make these simulations. Like I, I don't have a perfect answer to that. I haven't really thought much about it, other than it's going to be pretty interesting. Um, you know, blocks leading up to the merge and after the merge of what happens across DeFi, especially these money markets. And um, you know, uh, you know, I think it'll be a lot of frenzied activity happening and people trying to arb this out and um so yeah i think uh it's pretty this is gonna pass by the way it's 90 it's got one day left and we've got 96 percent saying yes so yeah i think it's the right thing to just be cautious and try to head ahead of potential i think it's a good reminder that like the the even if the merge goes well there's so much dependent on there's basically all these second order implications for things that are impacted by the merge that if protocols don't handle this right, there could there could be some messiness around the merge. What else, my friend? Um, I don't know if you want to talk about macro or what's happened on that front. It's always <laughs> macro's always been kind of a thing that <laughs> I want. To, it's like end of summer. About. I want to break from the macro. I'm like, I don't don't we get one week off from macro? You know, I feel like this is the week when everyone, yeah, uh, all the all the Wall Street folks are. are, are we're all supposed to go out to the Hamptons, you know? Everyone becomes like a shipping a shipping yeah. container expert given what's happening in the Swiss Canal. Yeah. It's like great. It's funny to see crypto Twitter just adopt. I mean, how, I mean, how dependent level. can we get a bull run in this market, in this macro market? Or do you still think we're entirely influenced by macro right now? No, I still think macro is at the helm here. Uh, again, near term, medium term. I do too. I mean, I sent this tweet out and I really strongly believe it, but like I'm seeing more innovation in DeFi right now than I've seen in 
over two years. It like, you know, that feeling in like late 2019 where you're seeing everything in DeFi, but you, you're like, man, like, why doesn't the market see what I'm seeing? Like, I just, yeah, I think give it six more months, maybe nine more months. And the, the product momentum in DeFi is just going to be too strong for the market to ignore. Yeah, I did see that tweet of yours, which says I, I'm really bullish on, on DeFi. And um, I'm curious, do you think that DeFi outperforms ETH? And does it outperform other categories like NFTs and gaming? As a category, yeah, I think it strongly outperforms NFTs. Um, NFTs haven't had their big bear market. They're having it right now. I think we're going in. I think we're going in it, but like, I think it'll take longer for NFTs to emerge from that than, than uh, DeFi. I think DeFi will lead the way in the next bull. Um, yeah. Would you say that like NFTs are like, like certain like things like collectibles and fine art and wine, which tend to be recession proof? Th- are they recession proof? I don't think they're... I- no, I'd be, it's, so I'm like, uh, well, people like make the argument of like investing in like some of these like alternatives. No, so no, it's wrong. No, NFTs are not recession proof. NFTs are at the far that absolutely not because it's like the like most of the people that are buying these things are like heavily exposed to other like are crypto users and like just recycling a lot of capital. And so, yeah, it's uh, they feel pain in their traditional portfolio. They're going to chop NFTs. Like you've got the risk spectrum, right? You've got like cash, then bonds, then high yield and hybrid securities, then property, then like developed market stocks, then emerging market stocks, and then like crypto comes in at the end of that probably, and then like DeFi is even past ETH and Bitcoin and then NFTs are like way, 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 way out. Like DeFi, like NFTs mm-hmm. are like the edge of Montauk. And like, I think people want to invest in like Long Island right now. So not that you're biased or anything, but <laughs> <Yeah>. sure. <laughs> How big is your bag of Long Island, like apartments? <laughs> Long Island city. I mean, I feel like Long Island city is a good investment. I've gone to two weddings there in the last year. It's booming. That's all. When we're talking about Long Island, uh, Long Island real estate on Empire, yeah. I think that's how you know uh, it's the end of the episode. I think so. I mean, we could we could talk about. It. Well, I guess before we go, um, any interesting book recommendations or movies or documentaries or something else that's caught your eye? No, no. I'm I'm like I'm like no. Too, it's just yeah, too busy I'm, on the my content consumption planning. is at a at a minimum right now. I would say. I haven't watched many movies. I mean, I'm watching, I'm watching The Wire, but. Mm -hmm. Well, I will say one. uh, I just recently read and also watched the podcast on uh, the Knowledge Podcast. I think uh, of Biology on the Network State, and I think it's a you know it's three hour episode podcast. Um, I think it's it's worth uh, listening to uh, and or reading the book Network State. Um, Oh, I've got one for you, Santi. I've got uh, "How to Change Your Mind" by Michael Pollan. Um, it's on. It's a. It's a book. Michael Pollan's a great author, um, and he writes about like the impact of like caffeine. He wrote one book on like the impact of caffeine and like the impact of plants on your body. Um, but he just he wrote one called "How to Change Your Mind" about psychedelics. Um, and for folks who don't want to read the book, they should watch. Uh, it just came out on Netflix mm-hmm. as a. It's like a four part series or six part series. Um, I. I this is sort of like the idea that like some psychedelics increase neuroplasticity you should, and help your Yeah, you should you should watch it. I mean, I'm I'm an episode and a half in. I also read the book. Um it's like what psychedelics teach us. It's not just about neuroplasticity and health. It's like what psychedelics can teach us about like depression and addiction and consciousness and uh yeah. Yeah. It's crazy to think that like like psychedelics, nuclear energy and crypto. <laughs> what is the common den- denominator of all three? I believe in all three of them. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Un- misunderstood, stigmatized, yeah. and probably yeah. warned for the research at minimum. I mean, the tweet of the week, by the way, too, uh, was that was the nuclear meme. It was a guy, you know, the he, there's two buttons meme. Yeah. And there was a guy and it was, like, you know, the guy sweating at the bottom and it's uh, it was Europe. It was like Europe is sweating and he's like debating. Europe is debating which button to press. And one button says, turn on the nuclear power plants. Uh, and the other button says, starve, but stay woke. And I feel like Europe is really like, do I stay woke and like, <laughs> like appeal to the like, you know, the, the, the woke crowd or like, do I turn on the nuclear power plants and like save our oh country? Uh, and, and Europe's sweating right now trying to figure that out. Everyone go and check out the great episode that we recorded with um, um, Josh Wolf from Lux Capital. Josh Wolf. We'll, we'll throw that in the show notes. It's so good. Yeah. Fantastic. Talks about nuclear energy, a topic that we feel strongly about in this episode, I mean, in, in, this, in this crowd. 
And yeah, I mean, unfortunately, crises are moments where hopefully people like unravel themselves from like old held dogmas and stigmas and realize like there's a way forward that doesn't have to be as dependent and hard. I feel like we're fitting into a stereotype right now, talking about but, nuclear, psychedelics, and crypto. We, just, we have to throw in longevity and then we'll just, we'll, we'll have the, we'll be on. Like, oh, I'll be past it. <laughs> oh, don't get me started on that. I think this is the, the cue to end the episode. Everyone out there, uh, have fun go out t- there. Go, go outside go touch uh, grass. and enjoy if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> All right, everyone. Have a good uh, have a good September. Uh, have a good rest of the week. Good weekend. We'll see you uh, see you next Thanks. week. Thanks, everyone.